Or when someone says, well, should you continue to do what you're doing? And we say, well, do you have any idea what that's going to do to my margin or the economic impact? Well, what we've just told them is we put profit ahead of principle and we undermine our public credibility. So we have to maintain that balance of communicating our ethical foundation, our commitment to their values, verifying it with science, and then people are willing to have a conversation where we can introduce the fact that, you know what, if we can't remain profitable, we can't stay in business. We can't farm, we can't produce food, and no one's going to eat. And that's not an acceptable outcome. So let's have an intelligent conversation about how we balance ethics, science, and economics as opposed to simply having two armed camps that are shouting back and forth across each other. So let's take a look at what it would mean if we were to roll back the clock to 1950. Okay? What would that mean to food production in society today? In 1950, we had about 5.5 million farms, 154 million people. One farmer produced enough to feed 30 people. Today, we have fewer than half that number of farmers, uh, 305 million population, about twice the number of people, but today, one farmer feeds enough to uh, 155 people instead of 30. So about five times the number of people that one farmer fed back in 1950. So if we took the number of farms and the level of productivity in 1950 and we just projected it on a constant line, we would be in a position where we would have no food for people in these nine states. California, Texas, New York, Florida, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Ohio, or Michigan. In other words, 151 million people in America would have nothing to eat today. Pretty tough to argue that that would be the right choice for people, animals, and the planet. Or, if you were to take the other end of that calculation and take the number of farmers we have today with the level of productivity in 1950, we'd only have enough food for people in Texas and Florida. I'm sorry, Texas and California. So we'd have 48 states that would have nothing to eat today. Pretty difficult to argue that that's the right choice for people, animals, and the planet. So where do we go from here? How many of you are involved in gardening? Anybody in here have a garden? A wonderful thing to do. Growing some of your own food is a really rewarding activity. You know, putting seed into soil, watching it come up, being able to harvest. Now's a great time in Nebraska to be picking your own tomatoes and harvesting your own sweet corn and really enjoying the fruits of your labor in a garden. And it's a wonderful thing to do. Not likely to allow us to feed the world on individual gardens, but it's a great experience. So let's have an example here. Let's use the BLT in a glass of milk, one of the favorite summer treats, to illustrate what production was like in 1950 and what production is like today, and what those improvements have meant for people, animals, and the planet. Nothing better than tomatoes from your own garden, the lettuce if the rabbits haven't already gotten it, and some nice crisp bacon to make a really, really good sandwich. So let's start with pork. Compared to 1950, we produce 176% more pork per sow with 44% fewer sows. That means fewer inputs, less corn, less soybean meal, fewer chemicals, less manure for every pound of bacon that goes into your BLT. And it's produced by great folks like Kenny Brinker in Missouri, who says, because we take care of our animals the way we do, we pride ourselves in supplying safe, nutritious, and affordable food. So Kenny does a great job of producing more using less than we've ever done before. We also know now that raising animals in barns is good for the animal. We've always known that, but what we've tended to talk about is the improvements in productivity and the improvements in efficiency and the benefits to the farmer, not the benefits to the animal or the benefits to society. But we know that raising animals indoors protects them from predators and parasites and disease and weather extremes and actually provides them a much better environment than if we had simply left them outdoors. Corn, primary ingredient in feeding pork production as well as poultry and cattle. Can't have bacon for that BLT if you don't have good corn production. And today we produce 333% more corn on only 11% more acres by great folks like Rob Korf from Missouri, who says with technology we have more capacity today to harvest a crop in a more timely fashion and to do it in a more efficient use per acre. More crop, less land because of the responsible application of technology. That allows us to continue to produce more food using fewer resources, which is the responsible thing for people, animals, and the planet. Lettuce and tomatoes, not a lot of that grown in the Midwest, but obviously in California. Compared to 1950, 12 times the production on uh, lettuce, 2.5% of the land. For tomatoes, 8 times the production on 3 times the land. Again, 
improved plant genetics, improved uh, practices on the land, better irrigation, all of that allowing us to produce more using fewer resources. Also produced by great people like Jason Rulig in Michigan, who loves being able to supply his state with healthy, fresh, and safe vegetables. Mayonnaise. Who grew up in a mayonnaise house by raise of hands? Who grew up in a Miracle Whip house by raise of hands? Okay, I grew up in a Miracle Whip house. My wife grew up in a mayonnaise house. So in our refrigerator, we have... No, I'm married. We have mayonnaise. <laughs> Come on. Help me out here. Of course, of course. So mayonnaise, a couple of the primary ingredients, eggs and soybean oil. You can't have a good BLT without good mayonnaise. Compared to 1950, 53% more eggs today produced with 3% fewer hens. Produced by people like Harry Herbrook and his family, who in fact have been producing them since the 1950s in the state of Michigan. Their families committed to making safe, affordable food in a responsible way because they want their customers to feel good when they consume products knowing how much care is given to each dozen eggs. And today's modern housing systems again increase the assurance of food safety and egg quality, better control over the hen's environment, and require significantly less land. In the 1950s we had uh, flock mortality in the 40s, today it's about 5%. So significantly better for the animals as well to have them in today's facilities. Soybeans, the oil is used in food production and things like mayonnaise. 98% of the meal is used in livestock feed for animals in Nebraska as well as across the country, whether they are poultry, pork, or uh, beef producing animals, dairy as well. And compared to 1950, we produce 11 times more soybeans on only five times the acres. By great people like Vicki Coughlin in Wisconsin, who knows the challenges of a growing population and takes pride in being part of that solution making sure that they can produce enough food to meet the demands of that growing population. Bread, who in here likes to bake their own bread? I have a favorite recipe from an uncle who passed it down to me. It's a great thing to do, particularly in the winter when you can smell it rising in the kitchen. But compared to 1950, we produce about 70% more wheat on 6% fewer acres. Chet Edinger, a South Dakota wheat farmer, feels good and takes great pride in producing food, fuel, and fiber for everybody around the world. And milk, modern dairy production, truly a remarkable thing. Compared to 1950, 63% more milk with 58% fewer cows. Stephanie Dykeshorn in Iowa says everything she does is for the health and safety of the cows and the quality products that ends up on the grocery store shelf. So we've got the same great people involved in food production today. Their commitment to doing what's right has never been stronger, but the systems are in fact remarkably different. So surely that means we can meet the world's growing demand for food, right? If only that were the case. We have record high food insecurity in the United States. 14.5% of U.S. households were food insecure in 2008. That's up 11% from the year prior. That's a remarkable statistic to have. Highest recorded rate since 1995, and approximately 60%, almost two-thirds, of the 30 million children who participate in the National School Lunch Program are on free or reduced lunches. That's remarkable. And when you look at the statistics by city, 75% in New York, 84% in Chicago, 67% in Miami, truly remarkable, particularly in a, in a country where we spend 10% of our income on food, 400% less than we spent just a century ago. In 1908, we spent half our income on food. Today, we spend 10% of our income on food. And during that same century, we nearly doubled life expectancy in this country. Truly a remarkable feat that we were able to reduce the cost of food by 400% during the same period of time we nearly doubled life expectancy. And yet we still have a billion people around the world and 11 million in the United States every single day who are food insecure, who lack the resources to have enough food or adequate food on a consistent basis. And by mid-century, we're going to have three billion more mouths to feed. Now, in terms of breaking that down to what that might look like, 75 and a half million more people annually or another country the size of Iran every single year for the next 30 years. Or a city the size of Los Angeles and Chicago every single month, adding one of those every single month. Or adding a new Philadelphia every single week to the world's population. Pretty significant increases at a time when we are already suffering from food insecurity.